stories, fables, ghostly tales. Welcome, listeners. You know, when I was in Canada, I had what was called a London fog. Do you know what that is? I had no idea. And needless to say, when I found out, I had to brace myself. <laughs> the London Fog is a drink invented in Vancouver. It's an Earl Grey latte. If you're ever in Vancouver, grab a London Fog. One of the best drinks I've had. Apparently, it's double brewed Earl Grey lavender and creamed froth at the top. Hold me back. Somebody hold me back. It was delicious. Speaking of delicious, I have for you today a Japanese folk story. The story of Urashima, the fisherman lad. A man saves a tortoise and, well, you'll have to listen. <laughs> so sit back, grab an Earl Grey, and join me for today's Japanese folk story. Long, long ago in the province of Tango, there lived on the shore of Japan, in the little fishing village of Mizunoye, a young fisherman named Urashima Taro. His father had been a fisherman before him, and his skill had more than doubly descended to his son. For Urashima was the most skillful fisher in all the countryside, and could catch more bonito and tai in a day than his comrades could in a week. Known more than for being a clever fisher of the sea, he was known for his kind heart. In his whole life, he had never hurt anything, either great or small. And when a boy, his companions had always laughed at him, for he would never join with them in teasing animals, but always tried to keep them from their cruel sport. One soft summer twilight, he was going home at the end of a day's fishing, when he came upon a group of children. They were all screaming and talking at the top of their voices, and seemed to be in a state of great excitement about something. And on his going up to them to see what was the matter, he saw that they were tormenting a tortoise. First, one boy pulled it this way, then another boy pulled it that way, while a third child beat it with a stick and the fourth hammered its shell with a stone. Now, Urashima felt very sorry for the poor tortoise, and made up his mind to rescue it. He spoke to the boys. Look here, boys. You are treating that poor tortoise so badly that it will soon die. The boys, who were all of an age when children seemed to delight in being cruel to animals, took no notice of Urashima's gentle reproof, but went on teasing it as before. One of the older boys answered, Who cares whether it lives or dies? We do not. Here, boys, go on, go on. And they began to treat the poor tortoise more cruelly than ever. Urashima waited a moment, turning over in his mind what would be the best way to deal with the boys. He would try to persuade them to give the tortoise up to him. So he smiled at them and said, I am sure you are all good. Kind boys. Now, won't you give me that tortoise? I should like to have it so much. No, we won't give you the tortoise, said one of the boys. Why should we? We caught it ourselves. What you say is true, said Urashima. But I do not ask you to give it to me for nothing. I will give you some money for it. In other words, the Ojisan will buy it off you. Won't that do for you, my boys? He held up the money to him, strung on a piece of string through a hole in the center of each coin. Look, boys, you can buy anything you like with this money. You can do much more with this money than you can with that poor tortoise. See what good boys you are to listen to me. The boys were not bad boys at all. They were only mischievous. And as Urashima spoke, they were won by his kind smile and gentle words and began to be of his spirit as they say in Japan. Gradually they came up to him, and the ringleader of the little band held out the tortoise to him 
Very well, Oji-san. We will give you the tortoise if you give us the money. And Urashima took the tortoise and gave the money to the boys, who, calling to each other, scampered away and was soon out of sight. Then Urashima stroked the tortoise's back, saying as he did so, Oh, you poor thing. There, there. You are safe now. They say a stork lives for a thousand years, but the tortoise for ten thousand years. You had the longest life of any creature in this world, and you were in great danger of having that precious life cut short by those cruel boys. Luckily, I was passing by and saved you, and so life is still yours. Now, I'm going to take you back to your home, the sea, at once. Do not let yourself be caught again, for there might be no one to save you next time. All the time that the kind fisherman was speaking, he was walking quickly to the shore and out upon the rocks. Then, putting the tortoise onto the water, he watched the animal disappear and turn homeward himself, for he was tired and the sun had set. The next morning, Urashima went out as usual in his boat. The weather was fine, and the sea and the sky were both blue and soft in the tender haze of the summer morning. Urashima got into his boat and dreamily pushed out to sea, throwing his line as he did so. He soon passed the other fishing boats and left them behind him till they were lost to sight in the distance, and his boat drifted further and further out upon the blue waters. Somehow, he knew not why. He felt unusually happy that morning, and he could not help wishing that, like the tortoise he set free the day before, he had thousands of years to live instead of his own short span of human life. He was suddenly startled from his reverie by hearing his own name called. Urashima. Urashima. Clear as a bell and soft as the summer wind, the name floated over the sea. He stood up and looked in every direction, thinking that one of the other boats had overtaken him, but gaze as he might over the wide expanse of water, near or far, there was no sign of a boat, so the voice could not have come from any human being. Startled and wondering who or what it was that called him so clearly, he looked in all directions round about him, and saw that without his knowing, a tortoise had come to his side of the boat. Urashima saw with surprise that it was the very tortoise he had rescued the day before. Well, Mr. Tortoise, said Urashima, was it you who called my name just now? The tortoise nodded its head several times and said, Yes, it, it was, was I. Yesterday, yesterday in your honorable, honorable shadow, shadow, my life was saved. And I have come to offer you my thanks and to tell you how grateful I am for your kindness to me. Indeed, said Urashima. That is very polite of you. Come up into the boat. I would offer you a smoke, but as you are a tortoise, doubtless you do not smoke. <laughs> and the fisherman laughed at the joke. <laughs> laughed the tortoise. Sake is my favorite refreshment, but I do not care for tobacco. Indeed, said Urashima. I regret very much that I have no sake in my boat to offer you. But come up and dry your back in the sun. Tortoises always love to do that. So the tortoise climbed into the boat, the fisherman helping him, and after an exchange of complimentary speeches, the tortoise said, Have you ever seen Ren Jin, the palace of the Dragon King of the Sea? The fisherman shook his head and replied, No, year after year, the sea has been my home, but though I have often heard of the Dragon King's realm under the sea, I have never yet set eyes on the wonderful place. It must be very far away, if it exists at all. Is that really so? You have never seen the Sea King's palace. Then you have missed seeing one of the most wonderful sights in the whole universe. It is far away at the bottom of the sea. But if I take you there, we shall soon reach the place. If you would like to see the Sea King's land, I will be your guide. 
I should like to go there, certainly. And you are very kind to think of taking me. But you must remember that I am only a poor mortal and have not the power of swimming like a sea creature such as you are. Before the fisherman could say more, the tortoise stopped him, saying, You need not swim yourself. If you will ride on my back, I will take you without any trouble on your part. But, said Urashima, how is it possible for me to ride on your small back? It may seem absurd to you, but I assure you that you can do so. Try at once. Just come and get on my back and see if it is as impossible as you think. As the tortoise finished speaking, Urishima looked at its shell, and strange to say he saw that the creature had suddenly grown so big that a man could easily sit on its back. This is strange indeed, said Urishima. Then, Mr. Tortoise, with your kind permission, I will get on your back. Dokoisho! he exclaimed as he jumped on. The tortoise, with an unmoved face, as if this strange proceeding were quite an ordinary event, said, Now we will set out at our leisure. And with these words he leapt into the sea, with Urashima on his back. Down through the water the tortoise dived. For a long time these two strange companions rode through the sea. Urashima never grew tired, nor his clothes moist with the water. At last, Far away in the distance, a magnificent gate appeared, and behind the gate, the long sloping roofs of a palace on the horizon. Yeah! exclaimed Urashima. That looks like the gate of some large palace just appearing. Mr. Tortoise, can you tell what that palace is that we can see now? That is the great gate of the Rin Jin Palace. The large roof that you see behind the gate is the Sea King's Palace itself. Then we have at least come to the realm of the Sea King and to his palace, said Urashima. Yes, indeed, answered the tortoise. And don't you think we have come very quickly? And while he was speaking, the tortoise reached the side of the gate. And here we are, and you must please walk from here. The tortoise now went in front, and speaking to the gatekeeper said, This is Urashima Taro from the country of Japan. I have had the honor of bringing him as a visitor to this kingdom. Please show him the way. The gatekeeper, who was a fish, at once led the way through the gate before them. The red bream, the flounder, the sole, the cuttlefish, and all the chief's vassals of the dragon king of the sea now came out with courtly bows to welcome the stranger. Urashima-sama, welcome to the Sea Palace, the home of the Dragon King of the Sea. Thrice welcome are you, having come from such a distant country, and you, Mr. Tortoise, we are greatly indebted to you for all your trouble in bringing Urashima here. Then, turning again to Urashima, they said, Please, follow us this way. And from here, the whole band of fishes became his guides. Urashima, being only a poor fisher lad, did not know how to behave in a palace. But, strange though it was all to him, he did not feel ashamed or embarrassed, but followed his guides quite calmly where they led to the inner palace. When he reached the portals, a beautiful princess with her attendant maidens came out to welcome him. She was more beautiful than any human being and was robed in flowing garment of red and soft green, like the underside of a wave, and golden threads glimmered through the folds of her gown. Her lovely black hair streamed over her shoulders in the fashion of a king's daughter many hundreds of years ago, and when she spoke, her voice sounded like music over the water. Urashima was lost in wonder while he looked upon her, and he could not speak. Then he remembered that he ought to bow, but before he could make a low obeisance, the princess took him by the hand and led him to a beautiful hall and to the seat of honor at the upper end and bade him be seated. Urashima Taro, it gives me the highest pleasure to welcome you to my father's kingdom, said the princess, 
Yesterday you set free a tortoise, and I have sent for you to thank you for saving my life, for I was that tortoise. Now, if you like, in the land of eternal youth, where summer never dies, and where sorrow never comes, and I will be your bride if you will, and we will live together happily forever afterwards. And as Urashima listened to her sweet words and gazed upon her lovely face, his heart was filled with a great wonder and joy, and answered her, wondering if it was not all a dream. Thank you a thousand times for your kind speech. There is nothing I could wish for more than to be permitted to stay here with you in this beautiful land, of which I have often heard, but have never seen to this day. Beyond all words, this is the most wonderful place I have ever seen. While he was speaking, a train of fishes appeared, all dressed in ceremonial trailing garments. One by one, silently, and with stately steps, they entered the hall, bearing on coral trays delicacies of fish and seaweed such as no one can dream of. And this wondrous feast was set before the bride and bridegroom. The bridal was celebrated with dazzling splendor, and in the Sea King's realm there was great rejoicing. As soon as the young pair had pledged themselves in the wedding cup of wine, three times three, music was played, and songs were sung, and fishes with silver scales and golden tails stepped in from the waves and danced. Urashima enjoyed himself with all his heart. Never in his whole life had he sat down to such a marvelous feast. When the feast was over, the princess asked the bridegroom if he would like to walk through the palace and see all there was to be seen. Then the happy fisherman, following his bride, the sea king's daughter, was shown all the wonders of that enchanted land, where youth and joy go hand in hand, and neither time nor age can touch them. The palace was built of coral, and adorned with pearls, and the beauty and wonders of the place were so great that the tongue fails to describe them. But, to Urashima, more wonderful than the palace was the garden that surrounded it. Here was to be seen at one time the scenery of the four different seasons, the beauties of summer and winter, spring and autumn, were displayed to the wondering visitor at once. First, when he looked to the east, the plum and cherry trees were seen in full bloom. The nightingales sang in the pink avenues, and butterflies flitted from flower to flower. Looking to the south, all the trees were green in the fullness of summer, and the day cicadas and the night crickets chirped loudly. Looking to the west, the autumn maples were ablaze, like a sunset sky, and the chrysanthemums were in perfection. Looking to the north, the change made Urashima start, for the ground was silver white with snow, and trees and bamboos were also covered with snow and the pond was thick with ice. And each day there were new joys and new wonders for Urashima, and so great was his happiness that he forgot everything, even the home he had left behind, and his parents, and his own country. And three days passed without his even thinking of all he had left behind. Then his mind came back to him and he remembered who he was, and that he did not belong to this wonderful land or the Sea King's palace. And he said to himself, Oh dear, I must not stay here, for I have an old father and mother at home. What can have happened to them all this time? How anxious they must have been these days when I did not return as usual. I must go back at once without letting one more day pass. And he began to prepare for the journey in great haste. Then he went to his beautiful wife, the princess, and bowing low before her, he said, Indeed, I have been very happy with you for a long time, Otohima-sama, for that was her name. And you have been kinder to me than any words can tell. But now, I must say goodbye. I must go back to my old parents. Then Otohima-sama began to weep, and said softly and sadly, Is it not well with you here, Urashima? that you wish to leave me so soon? Where is the haste? Stay with me yet another day only. But Urashima had remembered his old parents, and in Japan the duty to parents is stronger 
than everything else, stronger even than pleasure or love. He would not be persuaded, but answered, Indeed, I must go. Do not think I wish to leave you. It is not that. I must go and see my old parents. Let me go for one day, and I will come back to you. Then, said the princess sorrowfully, there is nothing to be done. I will send you back today to your father and mother, and instead of trying to keep you with me one more day, I shall give you this as a token of our love. Please, take it back with you. And she brought him a beautiful lacquer box tied about with a silken cord and tassels of red silk. Urashima had received so much from the princess already that he felt some compunction in taking the gift and said, It does not seem right for me to take yet another gift from you after all the many favors I have received at your hands. But because it is your wish, I will do so. And then he added, Tell me, what is this box? That, answered the princess, is the tomate bako, and it contains something very precious. You must not open this box, whatever happens. If you open it, something dreadful will happen to you. Now, promise me that you will never open this box. And Urashima promised that he would never, never open the box, whatever happened. Then, bidding goodbye to Otohime-sama, he went down to the seashore. The princess and her attendants following him, and there he found a large tortoise waiting for him. He quickly mounted the creature's back, and was carried away over the shining sea into the east, he looked back to wave his hand to Otohime-sama, till at last he could see her no more. And the land of the Sea King and the roofs of the wonderful palace were lost in the far, far distance. Then, with his face turned eagerly towards his own land, he looked for the rising of the blue hills on the horizon before him. At last the tortoise carried him into the bay he knew so well, and to the shore from whence he had set out. He stepped onto the shore and looked about him, while the tortoise rode away back to the Sea King's realm. But what is the strange fear that seizes Urashima as he stands and looks about him? Why does he gaze so fixedly at the people that pass him by? And why do they in turn stand and look at him? The shore is the same and the hills are the same, but the people he sees walking past him have very different faces to those he had known so well before. Wondering what it can mean, he walks quickly towards his old home. Even that looks different, but a house stands on the spot, and he calls out, Father, I have just returned! And he was about to enter, when he saw a strange man coming out. Perhaps my parents have moved while I've been away, and have gone somewhere else, was the fisherman's thought. Somehow, he began to feel strangely anxious, but he could not tell why. Excuse me, said he to the man who was staring at him, but till within the last few days, I have lived in this house. My name is Urashima Taro. Where have my parents gone, whom I left here? A very bewildered expression came over the face of the man, and still gazing intently on Urashima's face, he said, What? Are you Urashima Taro? Yes, said the fisherman. I am Urashima Taro. <laughs> Laughed the man. You must not make such jokes. It is true that once upon a time a man called Urashima Taro did live in this village, but that is a story 300 years old. He could not possibly be alive now. When Urashima heard these strange words, he was frightened and said, Please, please, you must not joke with me. I am greatly perplexed. I am really Urashima Taro, and I certainly have not lived 300 years. Till four or five days ago, I lived on this spot. Tell me what I want to know without more joking. But the man's face grew more and more grave, and he answered, You may or may not be Urashima Taro. I don't know, but the Urashima Taro of whom I've heard is a man who lived 300 years ago. Perhaps you are his spirit come to revisit your old home. 
Why do you mock me? Said Urashima. I am no spirit. I am a living man. Do you not see my feet? He stamped on the ground, first with one foot and then with the other to show the man. As Japanese ghosts have no feet. But Urashima Taro lived 300 years ago. That is all I know. It is written in the village chronicles. Persisted the man, who would not believe what the fisherman said. Urashima was lost in bewilderment and trouble. He stood looking all around him, terribly puzzled, and, indeed, something in the appearance of everything was different to what he remembered before he went away. And the awful feeling came over him that what the man said was perhaps true. He seemed to be in a strange dream. The few days he had spent in the Sea King's Palace beyond the sea had not been days at all. They had been hundreds of years, and in that time, his parents had died and all the people he had ever known, and the village had written down his story. There was no use in staying here any longer. He must get back to his beautiful wife beyond the sea. He made his way back to the beach, carrying in his hand the box which the princess had given him. But which was the way? He could not find it alone. Suddenly, he remembered the box, the tomate bako. The princess told me, when she gave me the box, never to open it, that it contained a very precious thing. But now that I have no home, now that I have lost everything that was dear to me here, and my heart grows thin with the sadness at such a time, if I open the box, surely I shall find something that will help me. Something that will show me the way back to my beautiful princess over the sea. There is nothing else for me to do now. Yes, yes, I will open the box and look in. And so his heart consented to this act of disobedience, and he tried to persuade himself that he was doing the right thing in breaking his promise. Slowly, very slowly, he untied the red silk cord. Slowly and wonderingly, he lifted the lid of the precious box. And what did he find? Strange to say, only a beautiful little purple cloud rose out of the box in three soft wisps. For an instant, it covered his face and wavered over him as if loath to go, and then it floated away like vapor over the sea. Urashima, who had been till that moment, like a strong and handsome youth of 24, suddenly became very, very old. His back doubled up with age, his hair turned snowy white, his face wrinkled, and he fell down dead on the beach. Poor Urashima, because of his disobedience, he could never return to the Sea King's realm or the lovely princess beyond the sea. Little children, never be disobedient to those who are wiser than you. For disobedience was the beginning of all miseries and sorrows of life. Ah uh, yes, some stories have the moral in the story and some stories like this one explicitly tell the audience what the moral is. Such a great folk story and one that definitely has the Japanese charm. It always bothered me that fishes serve you fish to eat whilst down in the fish realm. I guess they give themselves up to be eaten in an honourable way? If any of you listeners out there know why old folk stories had fish eating fish, I'm all ears. I mean, it's just fishy, right? Oh, was that too low? Terrible. It was terrible, I know. Now, shoutouts. I haven't done this in ages and I'm gonna scratch that itch. Shoutouts for my SoundCloud listeners first. These are the top 10 listening machines on SoundCloud for the past seven days. Doug Hill 2. Morinya, Logan Porter, Luluni, Lynn Geis, Quotato, Chad Warren, Freudus Glenn, Mark Craig, and Leonid Nerov. Thank you so much. My four top listening cities 
are San Francisco, California, Chicago, Illinois, and Sevierville, Tennessee. I'm certain I butchered that. Goodness. You lovely listeners from that place, please correct me or let me know if I got it right or wrong. I'd love to know. And Texas. Thank you so much for listening. And my latest YouTube listener shoutouts are... And a deep breath for this one. Matthew Bauer. Tom Keithley. Crowblood666. Nancy Mustier. JCK. Dark Sheiky. Janet Dimaselli, Lisa Dasher, Ariaga 2, Laurie Bond, Leandro the Crime Suspect Hedgehog, Ivory Cole, Angel with the Phone Box, Dora Medeiros, Dark Storm of Ages, M. Whale K, Squidrius the Great, Shadow Dragon 2569, Moby the Raccoon, The Eldritch Author, Golden Green, Ashley Pendorf, Teresa Jones, Risen Icarus, 97 Scarlet Witch, 6 Toppy, and Divided by Zero. Thank you all for listening and commenting. I really appreciate it. And some of the comments on my YouTube channels are really insightful. So much love to you guys and gals as well. So, I know what you're thinking right now. How can you as a listener help the podcast out? There is one request that I'll make to you lovely listeners, but it requires something valuable your time by recommending the podcast. You know, the old-fashioned word of mouth. The more you spread the word, the faster this podcast grows. And of course, that means more content, more authors, more stories. So, let people know the channel exists. Get them hooked. And I know people are doing this already. It shows in the podcast stats. So I'm ever grateful. And if you get a chance to convert a friend or family member to this podcast, I am ever grateful. And let me know. I would love to hear how you convinced your family member or friend to give this podcast a chance. I always love hearing stories like that. And you can do that by emailing me directly at storiesfablesghostlytales at gmail.com. So, thank you, lovely listener on the other end. Or may your day speed by during all the boring parts. And as always, my creepy-licious listeners, till next time.